Good morning, River Church. I, I suspect some of you are tired because you were like, like, like me, like several of us, you were here late last night. And so it's that, it's that tired but good sort of feeling, right? So last night was a, was a real good time. It was a real uh, success. I can give you the definition uh, of, of what success looks like for a fall festival, but I won't. Uh, but uh, Elise and Elise and Josie uh, and, and a team of minions uh, did, a, did an amazing... <laughs> I've always wanted to have a minion. Uh, did an amazing job. Did an amazing job. And so thank you, ladies. They're back there taking care of babies. But thank you, ladies, for the great job you did. It was a good time. Um, so if you weren't here, be here next year. Uh, it, we, set it, we set it up such that if you're you know, an adult, a kid at heart, or if you have kids, if you don't have kids, whatever, it will work for you. And it did last night. It was a, it was a good, good time. And uh, some cool costumes. Uh, let me tell you about what's coming up this week. First of all, Tuesday night, we have a prayer gathering. And uh, I invite you, I encourage you to be here. We're going to do this for a few more weeks, uh, right up until Thanksgiving. And then we're going to take a little time off. And so uh, come and you can be prayed for by by uh, one of your pastors. You can pray for one of your pastors. Uh, you can be all alone and silent. In fact, that is the, that is the, the vibe uh, of, of our prayer gathering. So, so come and join us on Tuesday night. It's a good time, and there, we're going to be doing that for a few more weeks. We'll take a little time off, and then we'll start it up again. Um, after Tuesday night comes Wednesday. You know that, and Wednesday is our community night. And we're going to be doing that for a few more weeks, and it's going to sort of culminate, come to a head for Thanksgiving. We're going to be do some, being, we're going to do something cool as a church for Thanksgiving, but we're going to wait and tell you about that next week. But it will involve food, so that's good. Uh, but a few more weeks of community night. It's been it's been a great success. Um, I, I warned Pastor Billy. Look, when we do these things, community night. There's always kind, of, kind of, always kind of tapers off toward the end. Don't let that be discouraging. Well, it just hasn't so far. Hopefully, this isn't the Wednesday when it does. But it, it just hasn't tapered off. You guys just keep coming, and we keep having a good time. Uh, maybe it's Chick-fil-A. I don't know. But it's, uh, it's happening again this Wednesday. Please, if you're coming so that we don't spend mon- money needlessly, uh, put, put sandwiches. Uh, if you want a sandwich, if you want a, uh, a salad, whatever you want, put that on the card and put it in the offering basket when it comes by. Speaking of the connection cards, if you're new here, uh, fill it out, but don't turn it in. Hold on to it and meet uh, Lydia, my precious wife. Meet, meet Lydia and, and me at the, uh, at, the, uh, at the welcome table back there at the end of the service. For the rest of you, uh, this is, this is a, a really cool form of communication between you and me, between you and Pastor Billy. This is how we know how to pray for you. Um, I go back, I hold on to them, and sometimes I'll go back to cards that you turned in two and three weeks ago, and I'll, I'll pray for you again, and I may come to you and ask you, what about what you asked me to pray for two or three weeks ago? So, so it's, it's a valuable tool. Uh, just know if you fill this out, put a prayer request on it, that just know that, that we, your pastors, We'll pray for you. It's, it's a given. This is the last week I'm going to invite you. They'll, they'll continue to be, invo- uh, be available, but this is the last week I'm going to invite you to, uh, to fill out this card and take the financial, the generosity challenge. Um, a number of you have done this already, and I've been praying for you. In fact, I sent you, uh, I sent you an email. You, if, if, hopefully you got it. Um, this is the last week I'm going to do it. The, the idea is we've, we've invited you to between uh, to, to, to take the challenge to be generous toward River Church from now till the end of the year and, and, and test God and see if he might bless you, might open up the windows of heaven as he describes in Malachi and, and pour out on you a blessing. Or as he in the book of Matthew, as, as Jesus spoke, see if he might care for you exponentially more than he cares for the birds of the air who don't toil and worry and think and, and, and yet they, they prosper in, in God's economy. So I invite you to do that. 
And uh, one, more, one more week, this is the last week I'm going to ask you to do that. They're always available. I've got three here. I picked up extra. So if you want a card, you can get one of these, or there's some, some at the back table. You can fill that out. What that does is it gives uh, Pastor Billy, and gives me, and gives us as a staff um, a, little, a little foresight or a little uh, an idea as to, okay, where are we headed for the rest of the year financially, and, and what are we looking at for 2022, although this really involves just 2021. But I trust that if you're generous in 2021, the Lord's going to bless you, and you will want to be generous in 2022. Um, I, uh, you, you, you know that, that, that we, uh, I told you on Wednesday night, I told you in an email, that along with a lot of real successes uh, this, in, in the last two months, with new faces coming to River Church and, 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 and seeing people baptized a couple weeks ago and, and the, just the enormous success of community nights and the opportunity to bring Pastor Billy on staff full-time, with all those successes, has come a financial challenge or have come financial challenges. So I've made that clear to you, and, 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 and you've, been, you've been really um, uh, care, filled with care regarding that matter. You've, you've asked me about, some of you asked me more about it, and, 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 and some of you have given on, you, some of you started giving on Wednesday night, and some of you gave this week, and I, I trust that, 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 that many of you have come today to give your, 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 your best gift. And so we look forward to, to seeing how you respond um, to, this, to this need. As I watch you give uh, over the week and as I watch you, I trust, give today, my, my heart is, is full of, of gratitude and thankfulness. The, as, I've, as, I've, as I've gone through the, uh, the financial challenge cards and seen how you've responded. Some of you for the first time, because I know you pretty well, and some of you I know like this is the first time you've ever done that. Like you've really not taken that step of faith in giving to your church before. Like this is the first time. Uh, it's just been insightful, and it's been beautiful, and I've been praying for you. I've been praying for all of you as we struggle, every one of us, with our finances, and as we struggle, every one of us, with um, attitudes of generosity and, 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 and even the fear that comes along with that. So just know that I I'm thankful for you, and I've been praying much for you. So I look forward to seeing God bless River Church and get us caught up in our finances through our offering today. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for River Church. I thank you for these people. I thank you for the, the blessed privilege of leading them uh, and, and the blessed privilege that I've had to lead them over, over the years. Um, God, I pray that our, this may sound weird, but I pray that our, I pray that our best days are still ahead of us, that, that what you're going to do over Thanksgiving, what you're going to do over the holidays, and what you're going to do in 2022 here at River Church, it's just going to astound us. And we're just going to say, wow, we thought, we thought, we thought we were living in high cotton uh, in the past, but look what the Lord's doing at River Church now. Like, uh, uh, I just pray that that would be the case, Lord, that you would, you would, and when I say it, when I when I say that, what I mean, God, is that you would, would just really, um, really move in Brownsville, um, through River Church. You would really bless the people who whom you love dearly. You would bless Brownsville, and you would you would do it through River Church. That we might say, Wow, look what the Lord did through us. Look what the Lord is doing right here in this little church. Look what He's doing. I pray that you do that, Lord. I pray that you would. Um, speak deeply into our hearts today as Pastor Billy preaches. Um, as we have sung our passion for you, now we listen to your word with that same sort of passion and expectancy. As, as, we, as, as inside our hearts, we clap. We clap along as we, as we hear your word and we celebrate. Speak through Pastor Billy. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning, guys. Good to see you. Good to be here with you. Um, <clears throat> so when I was younger, I remember uh, sitting in one of my classes. Now, I don't remember how old I was because I'm trying to figure out like when this was actually happening. I can't remember. But I was younger and I was in one of my classes and I was, I would look at the, you know, this was this was when, when I was in either middle school or high school, but this was uh, 20 years ago. Uh, it's been a while. 
And, and so we didn't have computers in every classroom, right? Computers, uh, not, not like the way it is today, where every single kid, uh, for the most part, has some sort of computer, uh, something of that nature. We had like one or two computers in the classroom, and they were off against the, towards the side of the wall. Uh, and so I remember I would, I would watch these computers, and, and usually during class, uh, the computers were in their screensaver mode. <clears throat> now this is like old school Windows, uh, but they had this one screensaver that I really thought was super cool. It was, an, I don't know if you guys remember this, but it was the one of the rat or the mouse, and it was like going through the maze uh, as a screensaver, right? And so it would go through this maze and, you know, it would turn a corner and then it would, nothing would be there, and then it would go a little bit further and it would turn a corner and so on and so forth. And just around every corner you were extremely hopeful, or, or at least I think the mouse, the computer mouse was, um, that the, the exit would be there, right? That he could, he could escape from the maze, right? It was this, <clears throat> this idea that, you know, that something better is going to happen just around the corner. And again, I thought this was the coolest, <laughs> coolest screensaver, and it got my, my brain working. But interesting, interestingly, that same concept of, of you know, hope, hoping the answer is right around the next corner has bled into our culture, our society, right? We think, man, if I just get the next thing, then, then, then I will be complete, right? I'll be happy. I'll be satisfied. If I just get the promotion at work that I've been looking for, I'll be happy. I'll be satisfied. If I get the job that I uh, wanted to get, then I'll be happy. If I get the promotion uh, that I wanted to get, I'll be happy. If I, if I get the degree that I want to get, I will be happy. It could be relationships. I mean, you can apply this to anything, your house, car, um, just all areas of life, right? And, and I, all of us have been there, right? I've been there, you've been there. And what we find is, once we turn that corner and, 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 and get that thing that we're looking for, we realize that we haven't been complete. We haven't uh, been satisfied. Right? We still want more. When I get that job, I'm not satisfied with that job. I want the next job. Right? I want the, the, the higher position. When I get that new house, I'm, I'm not satisfied with that house. I want the next thing. Right? When I get that degree, that degree is not good enough. I need to further my education. Right, relate, relationships, the whole deal, it's all under this, I just need to do something more, right? Something more needs to happen. <clears throat> and so this idea, as we see it in our culture, has also bled into our Christian walk, our, our, our walk as Christians, our relationship with the Lord. Right? We want to approach God in a way it's like, hey, God, I'm doing these things, so you're going to be happy with me. Right? And, then, and then you do those things, and then, and, then, and then you feel better about yourself, and then maybe, maybe you mess up, and then you feel like you've got to do more, and you've got to do more, and you've got to do more, and it's never satisfying. Right? We're always like the mouse in that maze. We're always turning the corner, hoping that this next thing that I do is going to be what makes me right, and every time, every time it's not. And so today what we're going to talk about is grace, right? Grace. Uh, it's one of our distinctives here, but we're going to be talking about grace and how grace is a free gift to us. <clears throat> uh, to do this, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 2. But before we get there, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about Ephesians. So Ephesians was written by Paul, right, the Apostle Paul, and, and uh, he, so he wrote this book, and it's interesting, if you look at Ephesians, Ephesians is not like the other books uh, that Paul wrote, the other letters that Paul wrote, right? Usually when Paul writes, right, Paul, uh, you know, plants a church, if you read Acts, he's, he's doing all these things, he's planting all these churches, and then, and then he gets word back that there's some sort of error in their thinking, error in their believing. They're doing something that they're not supposed to do, that they weren't taught to do, and so then Paul writes them a letter to correct them, right? That's usually what happens in Paul's, um, in Paul's letters, but Ephesians is not like that, 
Right? There was no ill report. There was no, nothing bad that, that Paul discovered about the Ephesian church that made him want to write. Right? He, he, he simply just wrote them a letter. Now, I want to talk about the letter a little bit. I think it's, it's really interesting that, that, that he wrote this letter without thinking uh, or without writing with the intent uh, to correct something. And so uh, if, you, if you actually uh, look at some of the earlier uh, recoveries or discoveries of the, 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 the book, the letter of Ephesians, um, you'll see in some of the early manuscripts that some of these letters were, uh, as they were uh, discovered, uh, in chapter 1, verse 1, where it says to, to the church in Ephesus that, that the, the Ephesus was blank. Right? There was a space there. And so, <clears throat> and, you know, why was that the case? Why was there a space in Ephesians 1? Paul wrote this letter. Uh, Paul wrote this letter when he was in jail. Um, and it's interesting, he wrote a few letters, but he wrote this letter and he wrote Colossians also. And so when he wrote Colossians, he wrote Colossians, again, to correct the church, uh, but he wrote Ephesians not for that purpose. He just wrote, and so if you read Ephesians with Colossians, there's a lot of similarities, um, but, but, but like I said, uh, Ephesians was written, and some early manuscripts have that blank in chapter 1, right? <clears throat> now, uh, People who study this, they say that the reason why that's the case is because Ephesians was a circular letter, right? So as he sends uh, his messenger to take the, the, church in, uh, the Colossian church, their letter, he also sent uh, the, the letter of the Ephesians to, uh, for, the, for his messenger to take it to that church. And the idea was is that the, the letter of Ephesians was written so that it could be dispersed amongst the local churches in Ephesus, right? It wasn't just to a specific church, but it was to a group of of people. It was, it was <clears throat> meant for their instruction, right? And so, so that leads me to believe that he wasn't correcting something. He wasn't, hey, hey you, guys, you guys got this all wrong. He wasn't saying that, but rather he was saying, hey, you guys, you need to know this specific thing, right? It's important that you guys know uh, this doctrine. You know the contents of this letter. I'm, again, I'm not correcting you, but this is what you need to know. It's like, it's like a dad who is correcting his son, right? His son does something bad. Like, so say William did something bad. Maybe he knocked over all the donuts, right? And I, I said, hey, son, you don't do that, right? That's what the letter was to the Colossians. To Ephesians, it would be like, hey, William, we're about to go to the church. There's going to be donuts on the table back there. I know you're going to want to do this thing. You're going to want to knock them over. Don't do that, right? Giving them a forewarning of what's to come. And so, again, this letter isn't so much about correcting something, but rather uh, to make sure that these Christians uh, knew what was correct. Right? They knew uh, what was sound doctrine. They knew what they should be believing as a church. They knew what they should be uh, teaching and preaching and how they should act as a church. That's, that's the letter of Ephesians. And so as we read 1 verse 1, we're, we're not going to read it today, but you could simply, you could also read it as to the, to the, uh, to the church that is in Brownsville, right? Or to, to, uh, to, the, to, to, to River Church, right? We could insert our name into that passage. So I believe that <clears throat> one of the things that Paul wants his original audience to understand, and one of the things that he wants us to understand, is that because God saves us, that we should rest in his grace, right? If you look at Ephesians, it's, it's broken up into two halves, Right? The first half is the story of, of the gospel. It's Jesus you know, died for our sins. Uh, it's, it's a lot of uh, theology, the first three chapters. The last three chapters are what that looks like being lived out. So we're going to focus our attention on, on, on chapter 2 when he, when he really starts to discuss what grace is. It'll be in Ephesians chapter 2, 
uh, verses 1 through 3. <coughs> it says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Now, the first thing that I want us to see, and I think the first thing that Paul wants his audience to see when they read this, is that he wants us to remember, he wants us to know that we were dead, right? We were dead. The text doesn't say that, that we were dying. The text doesn't say that we were slowly fading away or we were on life support or if you look closely, like we were pretty still, but our chest was moving. Like, that's not what it's saying at all. It's saying that we were dead. Dead things, dead things don't work, right? We were dead we didn't work. I had this plant. <laughs> I had this plant in my house. Uh, it was in the front. We, we had this big plant, in, and uh, for some reason, right next to this big plant, we planted a tiny plant. Well, it used to be tiny. It was a little tiny plant right next to it. And so uh, that little tiny plant grew to be a huge plant. I was like, man, at least we can't have two huge, like there's just no room for them to grow. So I, I took that plant. I moved it to the backyard. And I was like, all right, we're good. And so after about a week, <laughs> I, I looked at the plant and all the leaves that were on had fallen off, right? And I was like, oh, man, it just, it just needs a little bit of water, right? Lisey's got in my, uh, she's ingrained in my brain when, when, when plants start to look like they're withering, uh, to cheer them up, to make them happy, you just water them, right? And so I was like, all right, I got this. And so I sat out in the backyard for about 20 minutes every day, and I would just water that plant, right? Water, 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 water. And after about two weeks, <laughs> I just realized that that poor plant wasn't coming back. And so the plant died. The plant did not work anymore. If there was any life in the plant, Right, the water would have brought the plant back to life, but the plant was dead. And we, we too are, are dead. Now, we're not physically dead, obviously. We're, we're all here. We're not physically dead, but we were, a, apart from Christ, spiritually dead. Every single one of us. And Paul's saying, I believe, he's, he's reminding these Ephesians, right, I haven't heard something bad about you yet, but guys, be careful because Christians tend to think this way. Christians tend to forget that they were dead. And he's reminding them, he's like, hey guys, don't forget, you guys were dead in your sins. You were spiritually dead to Christ. And our deadness, according to this passage, our deadness is evidenced, right? We can see it by the way that we choose to live our lives, by the things that we do. Right? We, we once lived in the passions of the flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. Right? We all did this. We were all in opposition to God, every single one of us. And we, we may not have even seen it clearly. Right? You look at our culture today, <clears throat> and some of the things that they do, I'm like, oh my gosh, how could you guys do this? And it's not like, they're, they're thinking, oh, well, I'm going to do this despite, like, they just do, like, that's just how they exist. They exist in that brokenness, in that broken nature, right, in that sin nature. They just exist in that way without regard to other things, right? It's, it's, it's clear in our culture. We can see it, but I want to remind us that it was also us who were the same way. You see this in Scripture, in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah back in Genesis, the early chapters of Genesis, where there was all sorts of wicked happening in Sodom and Gomorrah, and they thought everything was good, and that's what they were going to do. And they, and, and, and they went to this man's house, and they were banging on his house, and they wanted to get the person inside and just do wicked acts to this person. And they thought it was fine. They thought it was okay. They were walking the passions of their flesh. They were spiritually dead. Apart from Christ, guys, I want us to remind, 
ourselves that we were that way also. You know, I was that way. I remember, this is, I don't even want to tell you guys this, but I'm going to tell you guys this. Uh, when I was in college, <clears throat> I remember this one time, like, I distinctly was making fun of God. Like, I was there with some of my buddies, and I was just, you know, joking around, and I started saying stuff, and I had no regard, like, oh, this is a bad thing. I should not be doing this. Like, nothing in me was saying, don't do this. In fact, I didn't care that I was doing this. I was walking in the desires of my flesh. Right? And, and all of us, all of us in this room were that way, whether, whether we were the self-righteous person, right? maybe the, the drug addict. I mean, whatever it is, fill in the blank. But every single one of us was in opposition to God. Right? We, were, we were dead before God. We were spiritually separated, spiritually dead before God. Jesus. And so, one way I want to illustrate this or look at a text is, I want to look at the story of Nicodemus real quick. I want to put it up. It's in John chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. It says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one else can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. God, verse 4 says, Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter the, to- uh, the womb a second time? Right, so, so, so Nicodemus has no idea how he is to be born again, but Jesus is saying you need to be born again. Now, it's interesting that it's Nicodemus, guys. Nicodemus, it says here, he was a ruler of the Jews. Right, He was a person like uh, a person who people would look at and be like, man, that person has a great relationship with the Lord. He was a religious teacher, right? He was also an Israelite. He was born, his natural birth was into the, uh, into the, uh, the, the Jewish people. Into the, he was an Israelite. He was someone who was part of God's chosen people. Right? And so, from Nicodemus' standpoint, he's like, man, I'm good. Right? I'm good. I'm a religious teacher. I am an Israelite. Right? I'm part of God's chosen people. I'm good. And what does Jesus tell him? He's like, it doesn't matter how you were born. Right? You need to be born again. Right now, Nicodemus, you're doing all these things. You, you're an Israelite. You're a teacher. But you're spiritually dead, and you're separated from me. You need to be born again. We must remember, guys, that, that we, we were born dead. Now, I keep hammering that home, but it, guys, this is crucial. Right? It's important that we remember this. It's important that we remind ourselves of, 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 of how we once walked. Right? If, if, we, if, we're not, if we're not aware of this, then this next part of the verse isn't that special to us, right? Grace doesn't mean that much, right? If I was, I was a pretty good dude, that, that's not what we're saying. The scripture says that you were dead, and we need, to, we need to understand that. We were dead, and we're going to move on to Ephesians uh, 2, 4 to 7. The next section <coughs> says... So we were dead, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised, uh, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ, so that... In the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. 
right? Paul's saying, remember, guys, you were dead. The next thing is, remember, guys, Christ made you alive, right? You were dead. I love this passage. It's a famous passage, but God, right? You were dead in your trespasses, but God. You, uh, your life may have been marked by sexual immorality, but God. Maybe you, are, you were a drug addict. You were uh, addicted to drugs, but God, Maybe the most self-righteous person, but God. You were living a life separated from God, dead to God, but God has made you alive. You were in the grave, right? You were dead in the grave. Christ pulls you out of the grave, has brought you to life. I want to answer a question real quick. Why, why did God do this? In verse 7 it says, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus, right? Why did he bring us back to life? Man, so he could get all the praise. All right, so, so, so people could look at our lives and be like, wow, Jesus is awesome. And you may be thinking, well, you know, that's not, that's not very, like, God's maybe self-centered. What's, what's the deal with that? And I've thought that before. And what I want to say to that, guys, briefly, is, is if there is something other than God who should receive affection, then God is not worth our ultimate affection, right? If there's, if there's something else, some other motive outside of God, some other, uh, some other thing that we are to be worshiping that God is trying to please, then God is not worthy of all of our affection, and that's not the case, right? He saves us to bring glory to his name, Right? When, when people, like I, I said this, when people look at us, they should not think, oh man, you know, Billy's awesome, or Pastor Randy's awesome, or Jacobo's awesome. They should look at us and be like, man, Jesus is awesome. <laughs> look at what Jesus did. Right? And this is going to be the same way even throughout all, uh, in, as we get to heaven. Right? We're going to be looking around in heaven, and we're going to look at the people around us. You're going to be like, wow. Can't believe the, the, the crazy work that the Lord has done in your life and, and how well, the crazy work that the Lord has done in your life. And we're going to look around and we're going to see these things and we're going to say these things, right? <clears throat> we have been saved so that Jesus could be made much of. Before I came to Christ, I was a selfish dude. Um, some of you all know my story. I... <clears throat> You know, I was in failed relationship after failed relationship. I did what I wanted to do. I was a, a, an unfaithful person in my relationships. And honestly, like, I didn't care. I didn't care. I was going to keep doing the things that I wanted to, to, to do. I was going to keep walking in a way that was unpleasing to the Lord. Right? That's what I wanted to do. I remember at one point, at one point, I, uh, I had this thought, right? I, I had this realization. I said, man, if I keep doing this, then when I get married, I'm probably not going to stay married long. I'm probably, you know, I want to have kids. I'm probably going to be absent from my family. I'm not going to get to be around these people as often as I would like to be. And the crazy thing, that, that, that was a horrible thing to think about, and it made me, it just tore me up inside, but the crazier thing is that I was okay with it. I was like, all right, I guess that's just how my life is going to be. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to engage in those things. I don't, I don't care. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. I'll figure out all the other stuff later. I knew it was going to be bad, and I still wanted to live that lifestyle. The 
The crazy thing is, guys, is, is but God, right? But God took me from that, and he, he called me, and, and he saved me, and, and he did this so that his name could be made great, right? Now, by God's grace, if anybody ever looks at my life and says, man, Billy, and I, I experienced this a lot in high school when I was a teacher. Oh, Mr. Garza, you have such an awesome wife, or you have such an awesome kids, and you have such awesome, your family's awesome and guys, it's because of God's grace in my life. It's because of God's grace in my life. I have a wife who I love. All right, she was just singing right now. My kids, man, I, I'm so happy that I get to be their dad. And that is only the case because Jesus is awesome. So when you look at my life, when, when, when you look at my life, when people look at your lives, Jesus should get the fame and the praise and the glory in our lives. Paul is saying that, or again, remember, Paul is saying he's reminding his people that you were dead, right? Christ has made you alive. And we're going to move on now. We're going <clears> to <throat> look at the, the last part of this section in verse eight, uh, verses 8 through 10. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It's like Paul saying, Hey guys, remember that this this grace, it is a gift. Right? You've been made alive. It is a gift. It is not based on your works. It was not based on my works. It was based on a gift that the Lord gave us. And, and we struggle with this, guys. We struggle with this. We want to play some sort of role in the Lord choosing us, in the Lord saving us, right? We, we want to feel like we played a part in this process. And I think Paul has seen this a lot in all the churches that he's planted. And in and, and just the lifestyle that he lived, he had seen that there's this self-righteousness to people. And he's like, hey guys, it was a gift. It was a free gift. Be careful with that uh, train of thought process that says, I did something to earn God's favor. That's not what happened. It was a gift, right? Every other relig religion, every other belief system has, some, has, has worked into the equation our actions, right? If we just do enough good things, then we'll be good, right? If, if, if I am bad, maybe I'll be just a little bit better tomorrow than I was bad yesterday, and I will be okay, we want to earn God's grace. We want to earn God's favor. We want to contribute to the story. And Paul's saying, be careful with that, guys. Be careful with that. My wife, she, uh, so my, ba my birthday was a few weeks ago, and my wife bought me some basketball shoes. Now, this was a gift from my wife, but... I was just thinking about this passage, and, and like if, if, if I were to try and make it about something that I did, right, I could say, hey, Lise, like, look at my feet. My feet are awesome, right? I deserve those basketball shoes right there. I mean, look at these awesome feet. I, 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 I deserve this. I'm good. Some of y'all see my feet, you're like, man, your feet are not good. I'll, yeah, don't, don't look at my feet, guys. I was wearing sandals yesterday. I don't know if you guys saw my feet or not, but Truett's made fun of my feet before. Um, <clears throat> but it would be like me saying, yeah, my feet are beautiful. I got beautiful feet. I need those beautiful shoes to be on my beautiful feet. That's, that's ridiculous. That's not what happens. Elise gave me those shoes because she wanted to give me a good gift. You see, Paul knows what's up. He's, 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 he's been around the block. He's kind of observed what happens, and, and he sees and he recognizes and he knows that we want to make our salvation about ourselves, something that we did. 
we want to preach that it is that is uh, that is something that we did that contributes to us being called. It's like that that rat race that I was talking about. We just want to do something to to feel like we are worth it. We are worthy of the gift that we have received. And Jesus says, no, it's nothing that you have done. It's Jesus. Jesus is awesome. So what's what I have done? And this is one of our distinctives here uh, at River Church. Like Paul to the Ephesians, we want to preach grace. We want to preach that it is not our work that saves us, but it's God's work, right? And the beautiful thing about this, guys, is in that when God's doing the work, we can rest. There is rest in grace, right? We, when we think that, man, we just have to do something more, we have to, to be better, we have to, to make our life, we have to clean up our lives, when we have to make sure that we are good, that is exhausting, it is tiring, it is burdensome. When we, when we accept this free gift of grace, there is rest in that. We don't have to earn God's favor. <clears throat> I get to rest in Jesus' work. So I have a question for us. Are, are, we, are we striving to earn God's favor or, or are, we, are we resting in his grace? Now the beautiful thing about this passage, guys, is it's in the first half of Ephesians. And again, that's a, the, the doctrinally heavy side. But, but, but out, of this, out of this work of who God is and what he has done, the rest of Ephesians flows, which talks about how to treat your wives, how to treat your kids, how to conduct yourselves, right? And so it's, it's, it's once we have received the grace of God, then he gives us the power and the ability to, to continue to walk in his ways. But I don't love my kids. I don't love my wife so that the Lord can love me more, right? Because the Lord loves me, I'm free to love my wife. There's freedom in grace. A lot of us come here burdened. And you see this uh, in the scriptures, that the the religious leaders they would they would put these <clears throat> they would have the religious law and they would put all these additional laws on top of what the scriptures taught and it became very heavy and very burdensome and it became into this legalistic if I just do the right thing then I am good and Jesus says no it's not about that come to me come to me and I will give you rest so if you guys are tired this morning. If you're exhausted, if, if you feel like you just can't catch up, if you feel like you're on the hamster wheel and you just got to do more and do more and do more, I, would, I want you to hear this, guys. I want you to understand that Christ has done the work. He loves you. He loves you. Rest in that. All right? I'll, we'll close with this. I want us to remember that because God saves us, because God saves, because God has called us, we should rest in his grace. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, thank you for the work that you have done. Uh, the work that we could not do, Lord, you have done. We thank you for that, Lord. Lord, I pray over our hearts this morning. I pray that those of us who have come burdened, I pray that those of us who have come exhausted, I pray those of us who have uh, just feel like they can't catch up, feel like they need to do more, feel like they are maybe dirty, unworthy, 
unwilling uh, recipient or unworthy recipient, Lord, I pray that, that they find rest. I pray that they see that you have called them. Lord, for those of us who, who want to rely on our works, who want to make ourselves right before God, I would, I would remind us, Lord, to push those thoughts away and just rest in the fact that you are good and you have given us this free gift, Lord. Praise the name of Christ's name. Amen.